I write as much as I possibly can every day. Uh, I, I get, I, there's a lot of things I don't get to do that are fun because I'm focused on writing a book. And it's, it's really all about the discipline and the self-control to choose what you want to do. And it's really about, you know, getting, you know, getting the, the, the self-discipline to sacrifice what you want now, which in a lot of times is doing something fun or, you know, sleeping, <laughs> which is a good thing or, um, or doing what you want most. And, and, and I've, what I want most is to my, my mission, my why in life is advancing sales as a profession and writing books as part of that mission and building my company. I've got a lot of people that depend on me and my organization. There's 16 people that work here. So those are things that I want most. And and there's no special formula. And, and by the way, the, asking me the question about books, there's a couple of, of books. If you want to be a writer, a couple of books I'd highly recommend. One is Stephen King's book on writing. And it's a beautiful book and it gives you, you know, it's, it's a, it's a colorful book. So it's a lot of fun to read. And there's another book called bird by bird. And it's not necessarily a book for, for nonfiction writers, but it's a fantastic book on the art and the process of writing. And then there's what I tell every writer, everybody who comes to me and says, how do I write a book? And most people will never do it is you have to write first, then you edit. You don't, you don't write and edit at the same time. If you write and edit at the same time, you'll be, you'll be on your deathbed thinking about the book that you were going to write. Awesome. That's great, man. Yeah. You're, you're prolific. I mean, I can remember the first book that I bumped into you, I was at the airport and I bought people by you. That was the first book of yours that I wrote. I'm like, Dude, this guy's talking my language. So, you know, how did you get started along this kind of communication with better people and sales kind of the joining of that, Jeb? How'd you get started, man? Well, for, you know, for me, you know, I, this is what I did my whole life. Uh, Anthony Anarino, who's one of my good friends, has got a new book coming out later this year called Eat Their Lunch. And it's a book about competitive displacement. So it's the, it's when you're selling in an industry where the only way that you win is to is to kick the competitor that's currently servicing your customer out. And I grew up in that type of an industry. I had to I had to go in and compete for the business with people that already had the business. And the, the, the product that I sold was a commodity and, and it was treated like a commodity. Now, when I say commodity, it was like corn or pork bellies or something like that. It was a service that could be that could be shaped so that it wasn't a commodity. But for most buyers, it was on the totem pole of things that were priorities. It was below toilet paper. And, you know, when I was 26 years old, I was making almost $400,000 a year selling this product that was not something that buyers spent a lot of time thinking about until their contract was up or and there was a problem. And in order to differentiate, the, what I had to do was I had to make it about the relationship. So I had to sell me first. So what I what I what I learned was when they made a decision to buy, they were buying me. They were buying me, and then the product. And then I had to ask questions. I had to provoke awareness. I had to to help them solve problems in their business that they weren't thinking about with my product, and 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 then present those solutions in a way that 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 made it feel like. I was building something specific for them. And, and that's how I ran into the, the five questions that matter most in all sales relationships. And these are the questions that you have to answer for your prospect. And those questions are, do I like you? Do you listen to me? Do you make me feel important? Do you get me in my problems? And do I trust and believe you? And it was through that crucible of selling things that no one really was looking for. They weren't cool. They weren't sexy. They weren't all the stuff that we, we, we like to talk about, all the stories we like to sell and making a ton of money doing that and being really successful that I understood the power of the human to human relationship. And it was at, at that point that, you know, I began writing and formulating these ideas and, and Phil, the really tough part about that, you know, creating these ideas is that you have to be able to shape them in a format that people can get and understand and connect to. Like you said, I picked up People by You, which I wrote in 2010, and it connected with you. And you said this, this, you know, this is this is speaking my language. It was it's the the art of crafting these ideas in a way that makes sense. I, I don't think that there are things that people don't already know. I think that there are things that that they just don't know how to articulate. Mm, yeah, that totally makes sense. That makes, I mean, we have to connect, right? That's the big thing. That's where, that's kind of the middle piece of all of that is the connection. Without connection, you can have the best product or service or the worst and nobody's ever going to know because it doesn't make any sense to either the person or to the, you know, to the company that you're selling it to, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. The connection is everything. And it's, it's a, it's a human to human connection, which is, you know, in, in the sales process that we teach our clients, we don't call it building rapport. We call it connecting. 
it, because building rapport is manipulative. It's, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's the process of like, you know, talking about things that are on people's walls and that type of thing. And, and it's usually a box that most salespeople check off. Whereas connecting is really about building an emotional connection with another human being like you would in any other situation. And that's one of the problems that we see with salespeople in the sales world is that in the rest of their life, they know exactly how to talk to people, exactly how to have conversations, exactly how to build you know, these, these, these connections, as you say. But when they get into the sales conversation, it's like they put a different hat on and they become this robotic plastic human being that doesn't really realize how to do that now and I, and I do think that authenticity I think that learning you know learning how to to relax and be yourself and that doesn't mean like being the, yourself that hangs out with your college buddies on the weekend at the beach like I'm just but you know but but being able to talk and, and, and be yourself I think that's something that that has to be taught and I don't and, and I don't exactly know why it has to be taught but it is a human condition and that we have a tendency to change the way we deal with people based on the context and when you learn how to build those connections and that you are, and you're so right about that, Phil, it's everything's about the connection. Then you can start connecting the dots between your product and how it solves a problem. You have to start with the heart first and then you move to the head. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so uh, you talk though, we, we've kind of made it personal, Jeb, but now you write a book about objections, man. I don't want to hear no. <laughs> so how the heck do I, how do, how, how do I learn to like no, Jeb? Okay, so let's start there. You're never gonna learn how to like no. Oh, um, come on, man! I thought you were gonna give me a secret. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to be here saying like I've got the magic pill. I can just wave a wand over you, and all of a sudden, you know, you're gonna love no. But you, it it doesn't work that way. You're you're never gonna like no. And there's a reason for that. Human beings who have you know have have been able to pass their their genes onto the next generation. Uh, have have developed a sensitivity to the word no. They've developed a sensitivity to rejection because being sensitive to being rejected helps you operate successfully in groups of other human beings. And if we just go back to, you know, say 40,000 years ago when the modern human brain really evolved to its present format, most human beings were living in caves or huts or with small groups of other human beings and getting rejected, getting told no that means getting kicked out of the cave could be a death sentence. So people learn very quickly that, you know, when the head of the cave is about to reject you, that's a good time to back off. So over the, you know, over the, the centuries, th this is the human condition. We, we don't like, no, we don't like to be rejected. And it's not a psychological problem it is a biological problem. It is, it is baked deep into our DNA. And, and, and something a lot of people don't realize is that rejection, when you get rejected, your body treats being rejected in the same manner that it treats you uh, if you were to have an injury. So let's say you were to break your arm, your body treats an arm break by, by, by releasing natural opioids into the bloodstream so you can bear the pain. It does exactly the same thing when you get rejected. And one of the things that we know about rejection is when you get rejected, it's the only emotion that if I were to sit down and have a conversation with you and provoke the, re the memory of that rejection, it's the one emotion that you can step right back into and you can feel it as if you were there. You cannot do that with other emotions. So that's one of the reasons why when you're in sales, you get told no, you dwell on that, you remember it, and you get a little bit gun shy, as they say, before you go into the next situation, which causes you to change your behavior, becoming more weak and passive and less assertive, which in turn increases resistance because human beings also on the flip side, right, we have a tendency to mow over people who are weak or passive and we move away from them. So it creates a lot of emotions in people, but it's not something that you're ever going to like, get past or, you know, or, 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 or or be able to be comfortable with. What we have to do in, in the flip side of that is we have, to, we have to create frameworks that allow us to manage our disruptive emotions in the moment. We have to be aware of where, where this feeling about no comes from because awareness is the mother of change. And then we have to have frameworks that allow us in the moment to control our emotions and influence the emotions of the other person. So it's a system and process that we work through. And the reason that these frameworks work is because human brains all work exactly the same and humans are incredibly predictable. So once you understand these things, it's a lot easier to manage the situation and improve the probability you're going to get a yes. It doesn't mean you're going to get one every time. I'm not making that promise, but you improve the probability in your favor. Awesome. So, so the girl that rejected me in eighth grade, just talk, thinking about that, I totally feel that. And then I think about sales and it's the very, very same way, but 
a framework for dealing with rejection. So give us a framework, Jeb, that we can work with so, so that the next time we get told no, we can be a little better. Well, let's, let's go back to the eighth grade, uh, you know, rejection that you felt and how that applies to self, because you're exactly right. So, because this is what's interesting. So if we, if we go to training rooms around the world, what, what trainers tell salespeople, don't take it personal. What trainers tell salespeople is let it roll off your back. And that doesn't work because it is personal and you can't roll off your back. And one of the problems is that an objection is not rejection. It's just not. Now, there is there are some objections, especially at the top of the funnel when you're prospecting to people, that can be pure rejection. Like I call you up and you tell me to go pound sand and not so nice away and say something about my mom in the process, oh. you know, or my dog or my uncle or what have you. That is rejection. I've been thrown out of a lot of doors. I would I spent you know an afternoon with one of my clients cold calling in New York City. We got rejected. It was, <laughs> it was I mean it was pure and simple rejection. The problem is is that even though objections aren't rejection, they still feel that way. Like you said, I still feel the same way. And human beings experience rejection in three different ways. They can have real rejection. That's your eighth grade love, you know, telling you no. That's rejection. There is perceived rejection. That is, I ask you for something, you tell me no, and my brain perceives it and treats it as if it's rejection. And then there's anticipated rejection. Now, anticipated rejection is a real problem because that is all the worrying that you do before you ask someone for something about what might happen when you ask. And one of the frameworks that we use to help you get control of your emotions in that moment like as you're as you're asking someone like, you know, to let you walk to their facility, but you're thinking about your eighth grade, you know, love that, you know, that, that just spurned your um, your advances is is something called the ledge. So it's a basic framework and it's in all of the objection frameworks and all the ledges is what neuroscientists call the magic quarter of second. So if you just think about your brain for a second, right on top of your brain, like a Russian nesting doll is the gray matter. That's the neocortex. That's the rational part of your brain. That's the part of your brain that can sit here and have a conversation about perceived, anticipated and real rejection and do it in a non-emotional way. Then you have the limbic system. The limbic system is the part of the brain that feels rejection, right? It feels the emotion. And it doesn't do logic. All it does is feel. So even though we're talking about your eighth grade girlfriend, you can still feel what it feels like, right? And, and then there's the, the cerebellum and that's the autonomic brain. In the middle of all of this is a little part of the brain called the amygdala. I call mine Amy. She's awesome, right? But Amy is always looking out for threats. We talked about how humans are sensitive to rejection and the brain treats rejection as if it's a threat. No, no different than if you're physically threatened, the brain has the same exact response to that. And when you feel threatened, your brain triggers something called fight or flight, which causes all kinds of crazy stuff to happen inside of you. So what you have to do when you are in that situation, either real objection, perceived objection, or anticipated rejection, is that you have to get your neocortex in executive control. That means you have to choose to rise above the emotion that you feel. And where we make mistakes in sales training is that we tell people to let it roll off your back. We tell people don't take it personal, but it doesn't work that way. The emotion is still there. You have no consent over your emotions. They happen without any decision whatsoever. You don't choose your emotions. You choose your response. And so what you have to do is rise above the emotion that you feel in that moment, right? When you're sitting there and you're thinking, I'm going to ask them to do something. Oh my God, they might reject me at that moment. You've got to be able to do something that gets you in executive control. So even though the emotions are happening, right? It's like that duck on the water. You, you know, you're paddling like crazy underneath, but on the top, you're smooth and you're cool and you're calm and you're relaxed because relaxed confidence transfers to your prospect as well. And that allows you to influence their behavior. You've got to be able to do that. And what alleges is typically something that you say, a statement or a question that you ask. Um, it can be in the moment for buying commitment objections. It's in, in, in the faster objections, like prospecting objections, it's something that you have to have mem memorized and it's rote. So for example, if I'm calling someone on the phone asking for time, they tell me they're too busy, my ledge 100% of the time is, that's exactly why I called. I say it every single time, I don't have to think about it. But as soon as I say that, it triggers me, my, my neocortex to say, wait a minute, everybody, this is okay. It's a prospecting call, no bear, not getting kicked out of the cave, not my eighth grade girlfriend, everything's going to be okay. And then I can, I can leverage um, the, the next step, which is disrupting the, the, my prospects, you know, train of thought, their attention, their buyer script, so I can pull them for, you know, towards me. So it's, 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 it all starts, all of our frameworks begin with a ledge. 
And then depending on where you are, if it's in prospecting, it's allege and disrupt. And then I ask if it's micro commitments, it's alleged you have to deliver value because people will move to the next step with you if you offer value for their time. And if it's a buying commitment objection, the ledge is relating to your prospect as a human, like you said, connecting with them. So I'm gonna to relate to you as a human being. What you said, you're, the way you feel about this is not a wrong thing, I'm not gonna argue with you. And then that gives me the mental acuity and the emotional acuity to step back and isolate and clarify exactly what the issue is so that then I can minimize your concerns. But without that, without that, those parts, it becomes difficult because we either jump into solving the wrong problem, dealing with the wrong problem, trying to overcome or argue or what have you. And as soon as we do that, we trigger all the emotional responses in our prospect, which then causes our call to become a you know a train wreck. Wow. Wow. So, so we can learn this in what, 10 minutes, Jeb? It wouldn't take us real long to do this or how long did, how long did it, does it really take? So we were with a, a team of salespeople three weeks ago uh, and we were, this is an inside sales team and, and more, much more transactional. So they're just calling in, they're, they're outbound calls and they're calling up and they're, and they're, they're trying to, to close the business right there on the spot. They don't always do that, but they're trying to do that. We spent an hour with them and the only thing that we taught them was, was how to ask. So how to manage your emotions and ask the right way. Because my, my goal essentially is to reduce the number of rejections I get by reducing the resistance that I get. That doesn't mean I'm avoiding rejections because I'm not. I want objections on the table, but I want to reduce them. And a strong, confident, assertive, assumptive ask, even though it feels different, but a lot of people have a hard time with it. They feel like they're being too pushy, but the but this, it's sort of a paradox. The more assumptive and assertive you are, the less resistance you get. The more you are less pushy and trying to be polite, the more resistance you get. So we just taught them that, and we taught them a couple of the frames, like the ledging frame and the disrupt frame, so they're, they're, they're able to, to interrupt the, 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 the buyer script that they're getting. We got a 600% increase in their actual sales run rate from the time before our training and the hour that we spent with them and then put them back on the telephone, a 600% increase. It was, everybody was mind blown over how fast you can make these adjustments. Now, learning how to do the, you know, to, to turn around a buying commitment uh, objection in a larger, more complex deal is, is greater than just learning the framework. It's also mastering the sales process as well. You have to learn how to discover. You have to ask great questions. You have to build your case. You have to connect the dots between what your prospect wants and what you offer using their language, not yours. But going through the process of doing that, if I if I salespeople who are doing their job in the sales process, you can learn how to turn around objections in complex deals in a couple of three hours. It takes a lot of practice. You got to work through the issues. And then micro commitment objections are pretty easy. And we give you all the frameworks in the book, everything that you need to do that. So how do you manage your own emotions? How do you influence your prospect and reduce their resistance? How do you become rejection proof? Not that you're going to not, you know, not, I can't change the way you feel about no, but how do you put the armor on so that when you do get no, you know exactly what to do and you can manage that and it doesn't become debilitating. And then in the four different types of objections you get in, in sales, prospecting objections, red herring objections, micro commitment objections, buy commitment objections, all the frameworks that you need to successfully maneuver those in context of your unique situation. And that's an important thing to say, Phil, because I don't believe that every situation is the same. And I don't believe that there's a black and white solution for every salesperson. And I certainly believe that there are a lot of things that work. I have a way, not the way, it's just a way. So the reason that we use frameworks is so that in your in your unique situation with your unique product and your unique client base and your unique sales cycle you have frameworks that allow you to shift and flex and adapt anywhere anytime to any context so that gives you the confidence that when you get a hard objection or you get a hard question or someone's telling you no you know exactly what to do and you can get past it and then win probability in your favor awesome awesome so so objections is not a super long read. It's an, it's an, it's an airport read, probably three to four hours, which is great, but man, there's a lot of meat in there, Jeb. So how do you, how do you, you know, you said you write every day and you do that, but man, how do you call out all the crap that sometimes we think we have to have in there to get a slim book that somebody can read in three to four hours? 
that is a very difficult process. Um, it is, it is, it's not easy. The, and some books you can't do that with. Sales EQ is not a three or four hour read. Nope. It's a much deeper read than that. And, uh, and, and, and I could probably pull another 10,000 words out of Sales EQ if I went right, if I went back and, and redid it again, having stepped away from it a year. Uh, but the, the key is, and this is the key to writing. We said this earlier, how do you write books? The key is that you write a lot. So when, when objections was originally, you know, the, the first cut was done, it was about 120,000 words. Today, it's about a 55,000 word book. Wow. So it's not about, you know, writing, the art of writing is not about writing. It's about what you take out. It's about editing. So it's, it's going through and going through and going through. And it really is exactly what you said, Phil, which is really intuitive. You, a, a great question. It's, it's being able to step back from being emotionally attached to the words and thinking and stepping into the reader's shoes and saying, does, does the reader really need this? Do they really need this word? And, and you, and you start pulling things out, pulling things out, pulling things out. And that's the art. Like the art is, that's, and that's like sculpting a book and, and try not to take out the meat, but also making it easy for people to, 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 you know, to, to digest. So if most of my books are that way, Sales EQ is the exception of that. And that book's been a, you know, a mega bestseller. It was designed to be that book, like the way that it was set up. This book takes great, you know, really cool parts out of Sales EQ and then dials it in a little bit tighter. So it's just, you know, it's, it's just a, a process. And I think that the, I think that the, the end game is that even now I could read the book and say, I could probably find, you know, I could, I bet I could probably take another thousand words out of this book. If I were to go back in and look at it again, after you've seen, you know, read a book, uh, you know, a hundred times, it's a little harder to see, you know, what's actually happening inside of it, but that's the art. And, and, and for people who are, you know, watching or listening, who are thinking about writing a book, just, you know, hear me when I say this, the reason that you're having a hard time getting started or writing is because you're editing while you write. You write without judgment. Just write. The first draft of anything, you're going to look and sound like a moron. If you saw the stuff that I wrote when it first came out, you know, you would go, how, how is it possible that, you know, you're a best-selling author of, of nine books? They, they should, you know, they really just need to, like, take you back to, to school. Or what college did you actually go to? Because they certainly didn't teach you how to write stuff. But you, you, you can't judge it. You have to write and then you start taking things out. And my goal in this book was to be around 60,000 words. I think, I think we're right at about 55,000 words. And, and, and like I said, we could probably get it a little bit lower than that by looking at things. But I want you to think about this because it's a great question. Think about the stuff that you write for your clients. Think about the proposals that you do, the presentations you do. Think about every written thing. Just think about LinkedIn stuff. Like you send someone a LinkedIn note, but I got one the other day, go had six paragraphs in it. I was, I mean, my brain was fried after the first paragraph. So think about the emails you sent. It's the same thing. The art is, it is, is how do you dial things into a message that connects with people quickly, provokes their emotion and gets them to respond to you. And, and, and across the board, and I'm just going to say this because, and y'all aren't going to like me very much for it, but we got a problem with writing in our country because a lot of people don't do it very well. And it's mostly because people don't take the time to sit back and edit what they write and step into the shoes. You said this earlier, feel connecting with people, right? Step in the shoes with empathy and, and look at things from the, the other person's perspective and write for them, not for you. Yeah, absolutely. So whether you're writing to write or you're writing to sell or you're writing to instruct, whatever it is, take the time to edit your work, let it breathe, you know, write it, I, you know, to your point, you know, Julia Cameron talks about morning pages, just get it out of your head on paper in your computer, and then edit later, because once it's out, you can see a lot more. But when it's inside, it's hard to see it because it's not clear. I'm glad you uh, mentioned Julia Cameron. Uh, that was one of the very first books I wrote, I read on writing, and I forgot all about that book. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but she is somebody on also. That you I know think reads. she's on writing. If is it on I, writing? I thought yeah. that was. Is it on oh, writing? Well, Stephen King's know. got another one. One of them. Oh yeah, a, no, no, you're right. No, you're right. I'll find out Julia Cameron's book. It's so, a great yeah. book. It's uh, when I first wrote my first book, I read a little bit of Julia Cameron every single day. And that was the motivation that I use, I used to, you know, to, to, to keep going. Uh, I just, she, she, it was so inspirational. Just you know, her, yeah. her words. The artist way. That's what it is. The artist way. Okay. Yep. 
that's what it is. So yeah, and I, it's funny. I I've actually got uh, right right here, Jeb. I've got bird by bird right here. Oh, do you really? Like it? Yeah, yeah. Which is that's really just, funny. I yeah. love Bird by Bird. That's a book that I read sometimes just to remind me of why I'm a writer, like why I do this. And it's a, such a comfort book. I mean, that's I, I know this is really weird because it sounds it sounds. Um, I don't know, so kumbaya-ish, but I like to, like, if it's if it's a cold day and it's raining outside, I like to get a cup of coffee and just read, and I'll, sometimes I'll just get right in the middle of the book and just pick a place and just start reading. Awesome. That's great. Well, Jeff, if you were to get people started on objections, right, the objections is the book. Folks, if you haven't gotten it, it came out this week. It is awesome. I've got the Kindle book, like I said, about four hours to read the book. Jeb mentioned 55,000 words. But Jeb, how, did, how would one get started right before they buy the book with objections and handling them more effectively? What I would think about is I would, I would go through the process that you sell in right now. So whatever your sales process in your organization. And what I would think about are where are the places in your sales process that you are getting shut down with objections or you're getting really uncomfortable or you're having a hard time finding what the words are and just sketch those out. The other thing that I would, I would have you take a look at is when do you get those objections? Are you getting them when you're being transactional? So you're not making the connection and you're walking through, are you getting them because you, you, you know that you have to do something. For example, I know I need to move to this next step, but I'm having a hard time articulating to the prospect why they should move to the next step. And we provide worksheets in, in the book for going through that process of, of building out those value statements. Why should someone do this? So I would look at all those things and become, you know, just, just think about it. What's, where are they? What's holding you back? Because as you begin the book, it's going to, and I don't know if you experienced this because, but as I was writing the book, it happened to me, you're going to, you're going to re-experience those, those objections oh, yeah. because of the way our brain treats objections. They're going to come back to you. So prepare yourself by going through and thinking about where you're getting shut down. The book will have so much more meaning for you after you do that. It's also a book, by the way, that I think you can, you can pick up basically any, all the chapters work together, but any chapter can work independently. So there are places in there where you may have to go back through and read it again and again and again in order to, to, to really nail down those frameworks and how you and your unique situation are going to use them to move past no. Yeah. Absolutely, Jeff. That's great advice. You can make it personal. This can be a workbook for you, folks. If you're listening in here, objections can be your workbook. So pick up a copy. It's on Amazon. You can find Jeb at salesgravy.com. He's always there. He's on Twitter, on LinkedIn. He produced a crap ton of content. So if you're looking to sell more effectively, get to know Jeb Blunt. Jeb, thank you for spending some time with us today, man. This was really, really helpful stuff. I so I appreciate love, it. I, and I love that. A, a crap ton of content. That's, yeah. A, a, <laughs> that's a gonna, metric crap ton even. Even I'm more. Gonna, I'm going to make that like, that's going to be my new tagline. Like I'm going to put on my t-shirts, Jeb Blunt. He produces a crap ton of content. Yeah. I love it. Isn't that what sales gravy is? <laughs> sales gravy is a crap ton, right? No? Right. Thanks for having me on, Phil. You're awesome, man. I appreciate it. And thank you for advocating for my new book. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much, Jeff. This was good, man. So cool. All right. So let's see. It looks like we might still be live. Let me see. Stop.